I'm in LA. I have an awesome morning planned. I get to sit down with Dr. Jerry Lipschitz at UCLA. He's a transplant surgeon, but he's an amazing creatine researcher doing some awesome stuff in gene therapy. And everybody asks me kind of since the show, like, how's the treatment going? Have you found a cure? Dr. Lipschitz is one of the many across the world who are making an impact and trying to find a treatment for kids like Lucas. I've seen him speak before at our symposium. He's brilliant and he communicates in a way that I like, I, even I can understand. So super jazzed to sit down with him and hopefully you guys hear some great stuff. How would you describe the thought process of trying to find a treatment for uh, a rare disease like CTD? The science is so exciting. So much has happened. So many small steps have lived to, developed big advances in the last five or 10 years. There was no approved gene therapy in the United States until 2017. We have, sorry, the technology today to treat a lot of things if we can have the courage to spend enough money. Someone like you who put it out there and said, I'm doing this to raise awareness of this disorder, but you're raising awareness of other disorders yeah. too, which yeah. you probably realize, I know your taxes are incredibly high in California, but you ended up with 50% of it, and I know you're putting some of it forward to ACD. Yeah. And it's just amazing putting your skills to bring the treatment forward is what you're doing. Like how does gene therapy give, offer promise, or like how would it work for a kid like Lucas or someone with CTD? There's some challenges in the field today. Some companies are pulling out of investing in gene therapy. Pfizer basically completely pulled out. I don't know all the details, but they were invested a lot in muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy affects, uh, the Duchenne muscular dystrophy affects one of every 5,000 boys, wow. excellent disorder. Well, then the biotech stocks have come way down, so there's less money investing into the field. I think some people are having doubts about gene therapy, but I think what I'm gonna show you still shows the promise that exists. There's different approaches for children with CTD. In the brain, other trials for rare disorders, they give it directly into the into the cerebral spinal fluid, either coating the brain or in the ventricles in the brain. So they make a, a neurosurgeon would make a, a hole through the skull, target into the ventricle in the brain with a wow. catheter, and they give us a very small amount of it. Others, like for Parkinson's disease, you might put a needle with a guidance of CAT scan or M a CAT scan directly into like the substantia nigra or retainment, an area of the brain that's abnormal because of Parkinson's and deliver a tiny amount of virus there and correct the disorder. But other people have made some advances, some companies in particular and other institutions where they have found that they've been able to modify the virus that if you give it in the vein, at least in mice and monkeys, it can go into the brain. Wow. See, it's really neat. The brain is really protected by these cells the vast vessels called the blood-brain barrier. And it's protect us from getting viruses in the brain and other things in the brain. And they found a way to have these viruses cross over and deliver its payload to the brain. And that's kind of what we've been working on with their technology. And it's, I mean, it's, I never, I, biology was never my sweet spot. Um, but I've learned more about it, obviously, the last six years with Lucas. Yes. It's a lot of people ask, like, what's the difference between a drug? What's the difference between a treatment? What's there between gene therapy? Can you just kind of share like what gene therapy would yes. do for a condition like this? It's 2025, and this conversation could be different in 2040. Yeah. Gene therapy is delivering genetic material, and the way you might, the genetic material you might be delivering might be DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, or RNA, ribonucleic acid. If you just deliver RNA into someone's blood, that's the instructions for another component in your cells called ribosomes to make the proteins, to make the normal protein. Whether the protein goes into your bloodstream to prevent, to make your blood clot normally, whether the protein goes into the surface of the cell to make the transporter to bring in creatine, or it has another function to break down something called an enzyme. DNA is in the nucleus of the cell. It makes the RNA, which goes into the, which is in the cytoplasm, in the surrounding of the nucleus, and that is the instruction for the cell to make that essential protein. So in gene therapy, you're giving something that takes the, brings the DNA into the cell or brings the RNA into the cell. You might say to yourself, well, but why do we need that? Why can't we just inject the RNA in the bloodstream or the DNA in the bloodstream? Well, our bodies have learned over the millennia, if you have free DNA or particularly free RNA in the bloodstream, that's not good. It could be from some virus trying to invade your body. So we have 
systems in our body to destroy it. Yeah. So to deliver it to you, you have to be protected. So protected like as a virus, protected by a protein coat, and that targets the cells normally because it's a, they've evolved with us. Or you can make something protected. People make synthetic things, extracellular vesicles, or like what Moderna did to make this lipid protein layer and they put the RNA inside and that's how they made the vaccine along with other companies. So you're delivering the genetic component, you're delivering the instructions to make the protein. And so it says, hey, here's, here's all the instructions to get to the brain and then is it like it gets released or how does it know where to go when it's in the brain? At this point, as I understand it, people are very likely working to develop like the RNA space to go to the brain. But as the present time, I don't think there's any RNA therapy by a lipid nanoparticle that will cross the blood brain barrier that I know of. I'm certain that companies are working on this because it's very, it's, it's very much needed. So what companies and institutions have done is they detargeted it. They learned ways to modify that protein, that outer layer to make it cross the blood brain barrier to the ability to do that and to then uh, go into brain cells. Okay. So let's, let's just fast forward and say, this has been tested, the toxicity and safety and efficacy is great. We're actually injecting it into children with CTD. Like what happens to the brain? How soon does it transform? Like some of this is probably known and some of this probably isn't known. I say this with caution because I could be wrong and I, I don't want you to be upset or anyone else be upset by this. I don't think we know how much the brain can change after something that's been abnormal for a long time. How long is a long time? I'm not really sure. Is it teenage years? Is it 20s? Is it two? I don't know. Our mouse model for CTD that we've been studying, we see what I call metabolic changes in the brain within 30 days, 30 days after the injection. Now, if we correct the metabolic activity to be normalized in the brain, will that lead to an improvement in behavior, in learning, in speech, and everything else? In people, I don't know. Yeah. In mice, we do see some changes in behavior that I'll show you. How challenging is it truly to fund a rare disease like CTD? It's challenging because there aren't the funders for this. You know, the NIH has tried, they developed a program called Bespoke, where they, are, they sponsored six or eight programs in rare disorders where they want to develop platform technology. Because right now we all have to go through the FDA eventually yeah. and for your own gene and everything, it's all a big process. And they tried to simplify it, and they're trying to simplify it. It's wonderful to do in this, but they could only fund six, eight, nine programs. We're on our own. The companies they have to survive. I get it. It's they they got to go to more volume. People know about CTD. People want to help. And just kind of give people like an idea of from concept to actually a viable treatment. Like with, with gene yes. therapy, how much would you say that would cost to do the clinical trial? And this is the way I picture it and I'm probably underestimating. Two groups of patients, three patients each, two different doses. So phase one slash phase two clinical trial, three patients get one dose, three patients get a higher dose. You, do the, you treat one patient in a low dose, you make sure they're doing okay, then you treat the second patient, then you treat the third patient, and then you go up do the same thing in the second cohort. That's kind of what we call dose finding and some efficacy. Now, of course, we would do a lot of, we've done dose finding in mice, and we might do dose finding in a larger animal model too, but that's how it would work. Now, how much would it cost? From the beginning, probably somewhere between six to nine million dollars, just the clinical trial part, right. yes. California gave us one and a half million dollars yeah. to get to this point, but the next grant, we hope to have somewhere in that six to nine million dollar range we have for a clinical trial, that's the goal. And then we get the clinical trial, and it's kind of going, is there a, a pharma partner who wants to commercialize, you know, so it's, um, yes. Or if we can't, if there's a way to try to do it on your own, yeah. but I don't know if we can do that or not. We can get there if we don't think about profit yeah. and just think about the benefit. We can do it. I say, if a certain very wealthy person gave us $10 million, not me, ACD, whatever, we can do, you can, will cure the disorder. We're at the stage where there are technologies out there that have changed things so much. You've heard the talks at CTT, the little bit of success people have had, but companies on for larger disorders, larger, more populous disorders, 
have made some unbelievable advances that can really benefit a lot of these rare disorders. But it's it's having the funds because they can only do so much. Yeah. They've got to go through all this with their so they're, they're they're gonna have a bigger trial, it's gonna cost them hundreds of millions of dollars potentially to get across the finish line. This is our time to strike. It's so with that, like if you could just leave like if there is a, a parent out there with a child with CTD, to give them some kind of sense of hope, like what do what you think life could be like in the next five to 10 years when it comes to treatments? It takes me a lot to say this because I don't want to ever overpromise. We are in the early stages of what we're doing. As I said, it's really only changed over the last year that we've had these remarkable findings that I think are quite promising. But I think that there may be a therapy. Creatine is so important to the brain getting a little bit to it. We don't know what's gonna happen, but it's going to help. We don't expect a kind of a light switch where a Lucas is able to you know, be a normal seven-year-old. To allow him to, to function and live activities of daily living a little differently that are a little bit more kind of typical would not only be great for him, but be great for his brother and his peers. And then ultimately, a kid is diagnosed at birth and receive a treatment within a week, and it's like they never had it. Yes, but that'll be the special world where you and I will be cheersing someday and I'll, I'll be thanking you and Lucas will be with me and he'll be able to tell you thank you for all the work and like that's that's our ultimate goal here. I'm not sure that the person on the street realizes what you just said. When I was at ACD the first time, there was a boy there who had camped and he had been treated from birth with creatine. The parents said to him, they introduced me to him, the boy was like eight or nine and he sat down, he's working on camp. So maybe you won't have to take all this creatine and all your life and the problems with it. And he just gave me this look that just made you melt. Yeah. Because he looked at me like, this man's trying to help me, he doesn't even know me. Yeah. And it was just, it meant so much to me, uh, that, 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 that feeling. Sometimes people have these feelings when they're an anonymous donor, or they're not an anonymous donor. When you realize that you're giving, it makes such a difference that dopamine rush, whatever you want to call it, that people get to contribute to something that's positive. Not to get philosophical, but I think I think we're here to share. When you look at anything inside, whether it's the sun, the sun is sharing, rain is sharing, like they, they are sharing these things to help other things grow. When people with big hearts or big pocketbooks see a cause that's important and share, you feel it because I think that's what we're here to do. And it's our job as stewards to receive the sharing yes. and do good with it. I, I just think we're so blessed to have researchers like you doing hard, hard work to ultimately kind of get back to our kids. So I appreciate Thank it. you, thank you. You only lose if you quit. Thank you. The beautiful thing is I think we have a handful of us like you who aren't quitting uh, and are actually making advances. I'd love to see what you're working yeah, on. Sure. It'd be awesome. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Here's one, the mouse was given salt water, yeah. what we call vehicle, like six weeks before. The other ones are different strains of that virus. And you can see the green, it's glowing green. Yeah. There has to be a lot of protein there to see it glowing green. We can see there's a lot of protein, a lot of green protein. If you take the mouse brain and you, um, you must have given their lives for this, have, we section the brain and we put it on slides. And then we look at it under a microscope that emits a certain wavelength of light so the green will glow, the green that, we've been, that the virus yeah. is producing, okay? The bottom is what it looks like if you just gave salt water. Okay, there's a little bit of glow, just a little bit, it's what we call background, okay? But if you look up here, this is that one special one that we've been developing. There's green throughout, in the outer layers of the brain, and deeper layers of the brain, areas involved in memory. Yeah, it looks like the Northern Lights. It, yeah, it does, yeah, the green like brain, that. Yeah. If the brain runs mostly on glucose and it takes more amount of glucose, you're gonna have a lot of activity. So in CTD, brain circled here, it's really red. It's almost all glucose, sugar, glucose yeah. activity. Yeah. In normal mice, wild type mice, it's it's split. You have less, much less activity. So this is the abnormal CTD brain. This is the wild type or normal mouse. When we give that gene therapy, it changes. It almost looks like the wild type, yeah. the normal mouse. So it's converted that excess glucose activity to be more like the normal mouse because we've restored creatine in the brain. This is now creatine. This is new. This is fresh. We have to do these studies more. Yeah. You know, this is the first time we're showing It's preliminary, it's preliminary yeah. but it's yeah. promising. Yeah. Okay. So if we look here, we're measuring creatine. So the higher the bar up is here, 
the more creatine there is. The lower there is, there's less, yeah. okay? So in a, in a wild type or normal mouse, in the frontal lobe of the brain, this is how much creatine you have. This number is about 60. In CTD, in the, we have so basically zero. zero. Here's three different gene therapies that we developed. This is the one that is the one I've been focused on this slide. It's restored. The level of creatine in this frontal lobe of this mouse brain, these three, three is yeah. normal. Three, three, it's yeah. above normal. Yeah. If we look in this in the cerebellum, the back part of the brain, here's normal mouse. It's around 50 or so. Here's the mutant. It's basically zero. Here's that one we're talking about again. It's but you see, it's restored or above normal. This is the first time we've ever seen anything like this. Most of the time, it's like this. We yeah. get very little. Yeah. But in this case, we're seeing levels that are that we never thought that we could achieve. The life of a mouse in a cage is not so pleasant. You know, they're not getting to explore. But if you put something in for them to explore, like we call it a nestle, it's sort of like a very hard cotton ball. They'll play okay. around with it. They'll play around with it, but they'll chew it up. Yeah. You put them in, they're squares. And in this picture is five hours later. They'll, they'll tear it up, they'll make a nest. Eventually, even the mutant mice will yeah. do it. It'll take a, long, long, a much longer time, but this is after five hours. So the mutant mouse, the squares chew a little bit. Again, this is a wild type mouse, a normal mouse. In five hours, it's already chewed up, most of it's making a nest. Here's one of those viruses. It shows that we have some behavior change. These mice were injected when they're about 30 days old, and this is um, about 30 days after yeah. this year. This is the first time we've seen anything like this. So it's pro it's promising. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a start. Yeah. yeah, we're moving in the direction that it's in hopeful. This is how the sausage is made. This is how it's made. It's these chewing up cotton. Yeah, exactly. It's injecting mice. It's unfortunate that mice are giving their lives to this, and we do take good care of them, and we think about you know this a lot. But it's showing that maybe something for these families and these children and these young adults that maybe maybe there'll be an opportunity. Yeah. We'll only know with more studies. Yeah. But we're gonna help you. We'll figure it out. And if I need to go I need to go camp out in front of the California Institute. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I'll, I'll do thank it. You. Dr. Lipschitz. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jerry. Okay. Thank course. you so much. Of course, thank you. Thank you. Just got done sitting down with Jerry. Um, I can't call him Dr. Lipschitz anymore. Amazing, amazing meeting. Learned so much. And again, I'm an optimistic guy, but I am so full of hope right now. All you guys should be too, that we will find a treatment for kids like Lucas. It's gonna happen. Dr. Lipschitz, thanks so much for the time. UCLA, amazing place. See you soon.